the Catholic Church became the sole hope through which European civilization could cling to the heritage of the Roman Empire. It was essentially a sacred order dedicated to the idea of civilization itself, and it did everything in its power to cement itself as the autonomous nervous system of the newly forming body of universal European Christendom, including such bold moves as falsifying a series of documents providing legal backing for this autonomy and an unprecedented authority. During the turbulent times of the Dark Ages, the clergy became an incredibly vital part of society. To cooperate with the church was an evolutionary adaptive trait for the ruler and his lands, because they could serve both as administration and a cultural unifying force. The added bonus of different degrees of at least nominal celibacy meant that the church was not a threat as far as dynastic politics goes. They essentially played a very similar role as did the Chinese court eunuchs. Interestingly and somewhat counterintuitively, it seems that every society needs skilled people who however do not reproduce, therefore society is not flooded by ambitious offspring. The incredible series of adaptations and strategies the church invented in the first millennium of its development resulted in a Christian golden age around 1000 AD. We call these times the High Middle Ages, and they can be seen as the answer to the question why the European culture is so-called guild-based society, as opposed to the rest of the world which mostly centers itself on shame or fear. You can infer if an institution is in its golden age from whether it has the bravery to use its authority to decisively fight with its rivals. Essentially, if it has the balls to take on the world. It does not necessarily need to win, but it speaks volumes about its perceived strength. And taking on the world was precisely what the Church of the High Middle Ages felt it was capable of. In the realm of domestic matters, it openly went into conflict with Holy Roman Emperors in efforts to entrench its authority, for example during the Gregorian reforms. In larger matters of Christianity itself, it pretty much decided that it did not need any Eastern Church that was not subordinate to Rome, causing the Great Schism. And finally, it also felt the need to take up the sword and perform a series of crusades, first against the Muslims and then against the Baltic pagans. However, while personally feeling very self-confident, we can start to see the first cracks in Catholic way of thinking. The necessity to build their whole teachings around compromises with the intellectual abilities of uneducated peasants is already in these times producing proto-reformist movements of Cathars, Valdensians, Lollards and later Hussites. Whenever a normal person learns how to read, and when he achieves certain economic success either as a craftsman or a merchant, he then is capable of thinking about the disharmony between first, church's behavior, second, church's preachings, third, what is actually written in the holy text, and fourth, how the real world actually behaves. Essentially, at this time, the church does not yet know it, but it most certainly is heading to centuries of failures of its fundamental teachings. Failures, which will eventually result in Catholicism being utterly obsolete by the times of modernity. Welcome to the first installment of my series History and Failure of the Catholic Church. Today we will talk about the first and the last golden age of Catholicism, the triumph of the High Middle Ages. Welcome to Magne Mirare. One of the most important things to realize when looking at a powerful institution which dominates its paradigm is that the institution and its strategies are not built for the time of its triumph. All of these adaptations are the result of the previous time of crisis, the times of struggle which forced them to formulate their own tenets. In the case of the triumph of Catholic Church of the High Middle Ages, this means that they are essentially the strongest and the most successful force of the previous Dark Ages. And once you are this successful, it is very hard to change established norms. This is coincidentally the reason why I spent so much time in the previous episode 
talking mostly about the historical developments. In certain abstract layers, the church calling for example for the crusades, or for burning of heretics, is not a high medieval church. It is a church traumatized by their memories of Merovingian kinsling or Aryan Germanic invasions. They live haunted by the shadows of the past, the shadows which became an evolutionary bottleneck, and only those who were haunted by these shadows survived. This essentially means that any adaptations which actually work are coincidentally transforming the whole ecosystem and are therefore laying the groundwork for a new evolutionary bottleneck. To convey its ethical teachings, mythologies and mystical truths, the church had to make a series of compromises. For example, it did preach poverty, but could not reliably do so without wealth. Coincidentally, humble diligence, the spear and shield of the monastic movement, were of course incredibly good at generating said wealth, as it is meritocratically deserved for anyone who adopts evolutionary adaptive virtues. On the other hand, having a series of bitter experiences with dynastic politics and the utter bloodbath of early medieval Europe, of course the church doubled down on the papal primacy and started to create forgeries like the donation of Constantine or pseudo Isidore Decretos to cement its own autonomy. The triumphant medieval church is a creature of immense inner conflict. It is torn between fulfillment of the realistically cynical agenda set by traumatic dark ages and between the pain of lost simplicity of idealized spiritual life of early, pre-Roman Christianity, the so-called Vita Apostolica. Both of these opposing factors produce incredible momentum, like opposite charges. And this momentum was heading towards one goal, towards a spiritual monopoly. Together with the restoration of the empire, thanks to the actions of Otto the Great in 962, the papacy itself was revived to its power after the depressing Seculum Obscurum. The papacy could thrive only in duality with the emperor. Both powers needed to intermingle, uniting the temporal and spiritual aspects of reality and governance into one political framework. But it was open to debate what the precise nature of their relationship should be. Later idealists would claim that the eventual goal was the achievement of certain harmony, of balance between spiritual and temporal authority. However, I am of the opinion that it is precisely the struggle to define this relationship, which was of much more use to European civilization than any kind of resolution. It was the rivalry between Emperor and the Pope which created a system akin to checks and balances. And of course, one cannot underestimate the vitality brought into existence thanks to an evolutionary battleground between different authorities. From the point of view of the papacy, the restoration at the hands of Otto was a great step away from the scheming of petty gangster like Roman nobility, namely the families of Crescenti and Theophylacti. However, it did not restore papacy into its desired political autonomy. It simply tied the authority to appoint popes directly to the emperor himself. This is a dramatic difference from the ideals of the Dark Ages, which sought to give the power to appoint emperors to the papacy. We can see the first hints of this desire for general autonomy of the church even at the beginning of the 10th century, when the so-called Cluniac reforms began to change the form of Catholic monasticism. It was a Duke of Aquitaine, William I, also called the Pious, who decided that if the monastic branch of the church was to thrive and provide its spiritual, cultural and economic benefits unimpeded, it needed to be shielded from the influences of feudal powers it needed to be as self-governing as possible. And hence, he oversaw the foundation of Cluny Abbey, a monastery upon which he bestowed many privileges and exemptions, making it separated and safe from both nobility and local archbishopric. This move has been so powerful that later, at the end of 11th century, it spawned a completely new religious order of Cistercians, the White Monks. We can understand them, basically, as the Benedictines of the Dark Ages on crack. With papal restoration, 
this trend translated into a great struggle for separation of the church from the imperial power in the second half of 11th century. A great impetus for the separation of papal elections from the temporal powers came after an incident in the year 1058, during which the Roman families of Crescenti and Theophylacti jointly appointed their own antipope, Benedict X, through military force, in an effort to move Rome away from German influences. His rival became the Pope Nicholas II, who acquired support from up until now hostile Normans currently invading southern Italy. The prize was acknowledgement of legitimacy of their rule. Together they deposed Benedict, however his life was spared because he was a cool guy and was sort of put in the position unwillingly. Nonetheless, Nicholas II acquired realistic reasons for a reform, and this was even kinda supported by the imperial officials themselves. And so a papal bull in nomine domini was issued in 1059, officially tying the authority to elect popes only to the College of Cardinals. This all was tied into a larger culture war, which was waged under the agenda of Libertas Ecclesiae, the freedom of the church. A prominent figure in this conflict was Pope Gregory VII, which started a series of so-called Gregorian reforms, in the foreground of which stood a papal bull, Dictatus Pape, issued in 1075. The general content focused not only on the autonomy of the church, but also on strong hierarchization of the church and the supremacy of Pope himself, including such bold statement as all princes are to kiss the feet of the Pope alone. And of course, it would not be a true papal declaration if it was not based on older fraudulent documents. This whole movement soon crystallized into one main issue. Who has the authority to appoint bishops? The so-called investiture controversy, during which both emperor and pope claimed to have the sole right to do so. A hilarious situation happened when Henry IV of the Holy Roman Empire declared Gregory to be deposed with the support of his imperial bishops. At the same time, Gregory declared Henry to be excommunicated with the support of the imperial aristocracy. This may seem counterintuitive, but think of it like this. Imperial bishops were appointed by the emperor himself, so they were, if not loyal, then at the very least scared for their own legitimacy while scheming imperial nobility, would love to see the emperor weakened because there is much to be gained from dynastic point of view when chaos ensues. Through this move, Pope Gregory forced the emperor to literally beg him personally to lift the excommunication, and also it caused a civil war in the empire. Despite that, the actual issue of investiture was not settled until 1122, when Pope Calixtus II and Henry V signed an agreement called the Concordat of Worms. This was a sort of weird compromise which separated the appointment of bishops into two rituals. One spiritual, performed by the Pope, and one temporal, performed by the Emperor. This shows that at least at this time, both sides needed to learn how to live with each other, because they really could not exist otherwise. One could mistakenly believe that such profound internal struggle would exhaust the church's capacities. But the opposite is true. Simultaneously, the church, full of ferocious ambition, managed to utterly shatter all connections to their orthodox brethren in Constantinople, as well as it got involved in a series of military campaigns in Spain, in the Holy Lands, and in Northern Europe, known as the Crusades. It would be misleading to believe that the Great Schism between Western and Eastern Christianity happened due to some high theological differences. In reality, as always, these were politics mixed with cultural tensions. The seeds of the discord were sown already during the Dark Ages. Unity of the Church was pretty much untenable, the moment when the Church needed to search for an alternative protector outside the Byzantine sphere of influence. Already in the 9th century, the Pope entered into a serious dispute with Patriarch Fortius, which was again for very political reasons. The lands of Bulgaria were newly converted to Christianity, and both guys wanted to proclaim their authority over them. 
And so it is no surprise that a church, which felt daring enough to take on the Emperor of the West, would also feel daring enough to sever its ties to the East under the inebriation of Gregorian reforms. As I already mentioned, southern Italy was under the assault of Norman conquerors. Four years before Nicholas II fulfilled Church's role as crown dispenser and legitimized their rule in exchange for military alliance, Pope Leo IX tried to reach to Byzantine Emperor for help in the year 1054. He sent his legates to Constantinople, led by Cardinal Humbert de Silva Candida, who was a staunch Gregorian reformist. While trying to get the Emperor to help against the invasion, Delegates were also authorized to deal with a second problem, which was basically enforcing papal primacy onto Patriarch Mikhail Kerularios, who was, in his efforts to fight against Roman influence, closing and persecuting Latin churches and monasteries in Constantinople. To build his case, he also started to throw around a series of ritualistic and theological allegations. For example, that the Catholics are using the wrong kind of bread for communion, which is... Ugh. I mean, one side is so strong in its convictions that it is actively creating fraudulent documents, and the other is offended by pastry. Politics were as stupid back then as they are now. Nothing has changed. As you might imagine, these negotiations were absolutely great and in good faith from both sides. And so it is no surprise that soon angry Cardinal Humbert entered the Church of Hagia Sophia, which means Holy Wisdom, where he slammed his excommunication bull on the altar, screaming, May the God see it and judge it himself. And that's basically it. The Patriarch, of course, excommunicated the papal legates in return, and here we are. Nonetheless, this did not yet mean an end to all diplomatic communications between the West and the East for there were still outside forces uniting Christianity against a common enemy. From the old lands of Persia, a new enemy arose. The Seljuk Turks, who converted to Islam a century ago. They became prolific conquerors, pushing against the Byzantine forces, eventually conquering both Jerusalem in 1071 and large swaths of Anatolian Peninsula, where they established, for example, the Sultanate of Rum, meaning Sultanate of Greek Romans, in 1074. This coincided with bad experiences the devout Catholic pilgrims suffered while traveling to the Holy Lands, for example during the Great German Pilgrimage in 1064, which was terrorized by Bedouin bandits. And so, thanks to the fact that both the East and the West had political and ideological interests in the Middle Eastern region, Pope Urban II responded positively to calls for aid made by Byzantine Emperor Alexius I in 1095. On the side of the Pope, there was of course the hope for mending the schism and establishing the papal primacy by being a bigger man. And so, European armies were called under the slogan Deus Vult, which is traditionally translated as God wills it but I think for modern ears it might be more comprehensible as God wants this from you, go fight. During the subsequent wars, a bunch of crusader realms were established in the Holy Lands. And these are interesting because they meant an opportunity to build a purely feudal society from basically blank state, unburdened by generations of different exemptions and privileges of the European world. Nonetheless, it didn't really matter how much soldiers and money were thrown onto the problem, and eventually it was deemed to fail, losing Jerusalem in 1187. From this moment onward, it was just a matter of time for the last Crusader holdings to fall. To add an insult to injury, during the Fourth Crusade in 124, instead of trying to reconquer the Holy Lands, the Crusade got swept by Venetian lobbyists who used the armies to defeat the Byzantine Empire itself and plunder Constantinople. And so it was that the Crusades, originally organized thanks to the Byzantine plea for aid, now faithfully crippled Byzantines, even supplanting their realm with 60 years of Catholic rule under the name of Latin Empire. What is more important than the actual gains of the Middle Eastern Crusades was the fact that they provided an outlet for the bellicose German and French who were Germans in denial. 
even though dynastic wars were still present in the European continent. Just the mere fact that you could oust your ambitious and aggressive second sons and offshore the issue, making it someone else's problem, meant a much needed respite for Europe itself. Another important fact was the establishment of the church's military orders. Up until now, sending a second son to the church was a good solution for a particular subset of children who were at least partially good fit for the cloth. The foundation of the Knight Templars, Hospitaller or Teutons meant that you could also disinherit but still provide a good career for those who would rather live and fight in knightly manner. The church itself also profited from this very much, establishing, essentially, military variation of their old, ever-present web of monasteries. With the loss of the Holy Lands, these orders slowly moved to Europe, creating the same web, but now with castles, fortifications and swords. On the other side of Europe, these Middle Eastern conflicts provided a great moral boost for Spanish Christians struggling against the Muslim presence in the Iberian Peninsula. This process can be seen as a continual crusade known as Reconquista, with the important difference that it was fought between neighbors and on home turf. Soon even here military orders were established, namely of Santiago and of Calatrava. Amongst these different military orders, two are most important due to their impact on European history. First, there are the Knight Templars, whose riches and activities made them into a banking behemoth. Their issuing of loans and other economic activities eventually led to their downfall at the hands of French King Philip the Fair in 1307. The second order with a profound impact on the world were the Teutonic Knights, who were, after the fall of Crusader Kings, invited to Northern Europe in 1230 to help in the struggle against still resisting pagans of Baltics and Lithuania. Here, they established their own autonomous state. In the future, in 1525, their Grand Maester would convert to Protestantism and secularize the land into the military monster known as the Duchy of Prussia, which eventually united Germany. Thanks, I guess. I must say I am starting to be very understanding of King Philip's cause. Having covered all these historical developments, I think it is fair to speak of golden age of the church. Despite the many conflicts and infighting, these were mostly not the existential struggles of the Dark Ages. Instead, they were the audacious efforts of a very confident culture to shape the world to its liking. And so I find it very important to spend some time describing this world and its functioning on an anthropological level. The Catholic teachings put a great emphasis on differentiation between different target audiences. There were different stories and morals for the common folks, the noblemen and the clergy. This is arguably a heritage of early church and Roman institutionalization, which is something I talk about more in the first episode. These teachings understood profoundly the pyramidal unequal nature of the world. For example, serfs who could not read needed mostly spiritual breads and circuses, with some amount of mental hygiene through rituals like confession. On the other hand, for the nobility, it was the legitimizing aspect of the church's crown dispenser nature that was of great interest and usefulness. However, an important factor for achieving stability in such hierarchical society was a perceived equality in death and before God, essentially equality in salvation. You can simply listen to the popular medieval song Stella Splendens. From all around they rally rejoicing, rich and poor, young and old. They assemble here to see with their own eyes and return from it, filled with grace. The rest of the song is basically a list of different social classes shown as equal before the glory of God. An important factor that made Catholicism so successful in this manner is coincidentally the same reason why today's Western culture is a guilt-based society and why the loss of spiritual background is slowly transitioning us into anxiety-based society. Since I will need a pause from Catholic history, I will probably soon make a video focused on this matter. But the basic premise is the fact that 
we humans are always anxious about our existence. This is the original sin in Christian terminology. And Christianity is, was, very successful in mitigating our anxious nature through transformation into guilt, something which can be forgiven and managed. The whole Catholic theology actually revolves around this management. On the other hand, the price that needed to be paid was servitude towards the Church. This approach led to formation of the so-called economy of salvation. Human innate anxiety became a monetary issue, and paying money to the Church was to help one to resolve it. A result of this was the slowly rising doctrine of purgatory. Instead of people being damned forever in hell, a special dimension was to exist, where one pays for his sins through suffering, with the eventual vision of being purified and permitted to dwell in God's presence in the heavens. And, logically, a great way to alleviate this suffering was to pay money to the church to take care of part of your sins. A crucial role in this salvation industrial complex was played by the monasteries. Monks became essentially specialists in praying so hard that they actually prayed for the society at large, and therefore should be paid by everyone in order to do so. As you can already probably infer, this of course had to lead to some controversies. The main issue of Catholicism of the time was that while it was incredibly well positioned to keep society functioning in conditions of strong hierarchy, mainly enforced by the chaos of the Dark Ages, it had little to no ability to actually deal with the world it already civilized and brought into prosperity. The moment when social mobility increased through urbanization and the economic successes of craftsmen and merchants is the same moment the church started its centuries-long limping. As the scholar Brian Stock describes, the first literate common people meant a drastic change in the manner in which society thought about its religiosity. He coined the term of textual communities, describing the first reading groups, usually united by few literate persons reading to the rest of the illiterate friends. A specific culture existing in between oral and written tradition was formed, and it led to a huge philosophical innovation the monopoly of clergy, was endangered. So, while the church could rule over three clearly defined estates of serfs, nobles and priests, it struggled with this new unpredictable element, the middle class, which is seen today as basis for industrialized society. These middle class semi-scholars were in many ways similar to the Axial Age Reformation. In having tasted prosperity, they desired idealized simplicity and purity of poverty. Some of the spawned movements were successfully integrated into the church's structure as a new kind of monastic order. The so-called mendicants, which essentially describes beggar preachers like the Saint Francis of Assisi, whose work resulted in the establishment of Franciscan order in 1209. A second great order of this type are the Dominicans, established in 1216, by Saint Dominic de Guzman. Both of these sought to answer the issues of the time, but in slightly different manner. The Franciscan answer focused mainly on poverty, missionary work and charity. The Dominicans sought to resolve the issue of newly opened social mobility through a large emphasis on correct education. Nonetheless, since both of these orders were a great product of its time, they soon found a very different use. The incredibly powerful Pope Innocent III, ruling from 1198 to 1216, wanted to institutionalize ongoing fight with heresies of prosperity and founded the infamous Inquisition. Both orders, with slightly larger involvement on the Dominican part, were to play an important role in hunting those pesky heretics. There are two main sources for heretical thinking in the Middle Ages. First, there is the mainly doctrinal conflict. People who disagreed with Catholic teachings and mythology 
because they found them lacking in certain aspects. This is arguably due to mystery cult heritage, in which the more complex teachings are kept hidden only for those of high initiation into the religious structure. And second, there were those who simply did not like how the church behaved as an institution and on an economical level. They perceived a certain betrayal of early Christian values of Vita Apostolica. In the first group, we can talk mainly about the Cathars, also called Albigensians, who were most spread in southern France and northern Italy in the 12th to 14th century. There is an undeniable similarity to some Gnostic styles of teachings, though the issue of what Gnosticism is and how it is precisely connected to Cathars themselves is a very complicated field of study. Popular certainty of a direct link between these two movements originates mainly from the opinions of the Inquisition itself and, and from when are we taking any advice from these guys. The main issue of Cathars was that they could not harmonize the very different behaviors of the God of the Old Testament as opposed to the New One. And so they essentially divided these two into separate beings, one being the cruel orchestrator of the material world and its tribulations, and the other being the etheric good guy, who was to save us from our material shackles. And one can understand how this happens on a personal level. On one side is the story of sheer cruel reality, with which one has to bargain with to achieve any standing. And on the other is an unequivocally merciful God of spiritual salvation. So, who actually were these Cathars searching for understanding and meaning in this universe? Well, they were the urban craftsmen population. Their main centers were guild houses, most notably the tailors, weavers, and people working with cloth. One can imagine why. To be a successful craftsman and businessman, intelligence, talent, and skill are needed. Also, such people come into contact with various classes, serfs, priests, and aristocrats. They all need clothes, and also they need to spend some time in tailor's workshop. So these tailors are important intelligence nodes in the complex system of society. And once they saw that they really did not fit into the established order, they started to create alternatives. Finally, their traveling weavers, going around different rural places, subsequently played a role in the dissemination of this kind of thinking. Despite their early successes, Cathars were eventually dealt with first through the Albigensian Crusade, raging between 1209 and 1229, and the rest of them were hunted down by the Inquisition. The added political benefit of this crusade, ending the autonomy of states in Languedoc, is probably why the French fought for the cross with such pious fervor. The second kind of heresies were those critical of the institution of the church itself. These are mainly represented by the Waldensians. Interestingly, the origins of their story are basically the same as those of Franciscans. Their founder, Peter Valdo, was a rich merchant who gave away his property and started preaching somewhere around 1170. However, at the time this was seen as an encroachment on the church's monopoly, and he found himself in a spat with first local clergy and later with the Pope himself. While rejecting new inventions like purgatory, the doctrinal differences and their influence on the status of being a heresy are small in the grand scheme of things. Most of these differences evolved much later, when Valdensians were already living in hiding. The true issue was the critique of the church's structure and values. The most important part of Valdensian identity was their understanding of the donation of Constantine and the politicization of the church. Surviving as basically indestructible mountain people in the Alps, they developed a whole mythological view of history, in which the acceptance of Constantine's gift was essentially the work of the Antichrist that subverted the true apostolic church, which was, from these times, surviving in hiding and secrecy, essentially as a mystery cult, only to be revealed by Peter Valdo himself. Valdensians were pretty much indestructible, and became one of the main faces of the proto-reformist movement 
surviving until the main reformation in the 16th century. It is no surprise that their teaching of the elect, the hidden true church, was later adopted and transformed by the Swiss Reformation. And finally, they had an influence on the Hussite movement in Bohemia in the 15th century. So much so that there was an actual correspondence between some Hussite branches and Waldensian churches, and Waldensian priests were actually invited to anoint Hussite priests to secure claimed apostolic succession. However, the story of this late proto-reformation and of the decadence of clerical structures is for the next episode, in which we will talk about the corrupt spiritual mafia that was the Church of Late Middle Ages. Thank you for watching, and I hope you join me in this endeavor next time on Magne Mirare.